What's up everybody? Well, it's harvest season again, and you know, kind of sad, I don't really have anything to share this year. A couple of people ask me, hey, why don't you show your garden? In the last few years, I've always shown my garden. Over here, this whole dirt area actually is like a third of my lawn that I dug up in order to plant my garden. And uh, it's because yards are kind of a joke. But it's just funny, I go through different phases. Like a couple years ago, I was like wanting to get rid of my front yard. Then last year, I reseeded it and took really good care of it. And just for some random reason, I was like, well, if I'm going to go to the trouble to reseed it and level it out, I might as well water it and take care of it. And this year it was the exact opposite. I just totally neglected the front yard. I had too much going on. And in the back of the garden, I felt the same way. It's like I'm, I, I wanted to go to concerts and do things and have fun and not have to worry about maintaining a garden. And those who know me for a while know I used to do indoor gardening too. And that's just a huge pain in the ass, especially in the summertime. It gets ridiculously hot and um, you got to worry about outdoor bugs and mildew and all kinds of things coming in, and it's just a huge hassle. Anyway, I was thinking about it because I just pulled this leaf off of my uh, tobacco plants. And this is just a nice sized leaf I harvested yesterday, and I'm going to dry them on racks. And I actually, um, I've been growing tobacco for about five years or so. And I, I, a couple of years I actually grew a large, uh, a couple large rows of it, but really, what do you do with it? I mean, I'm not a ceremonial tobacco user, but really I just wanted to grow it to know how to do it and process it as far as drying, curing, and even try to roll up, make some cigar-worthy pieces, because basically when you're making real cigars, you're collecting certain leaves, um, really high-quality leaves, and using those to wrap your cigars with. And I've, uh, I've spent a few years just kind of learning how tobacco grows and the, 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 the types of tobacco that I grow I use uh, uh, Mohawk and Havana and the Havana is very difficult to grow it seems like it just never wants to grow and not only that but once it does you get um, what are they called I can't remember they're, they're, they're like a bud worm basically but you know they get on there the tobacco worms or whatnot they get into the seed pods and they eat all the seeds out and destroy it so uh, those ones don't grow seem as well here as I have good luck with the, the mohawk which is what this is now this is the Native American mohawk tobacco that they grew for their ceremonial purposes and uh, I get this from um, um, a local seed you know heirloom and seed place that you know once you start growing your own food and you can harvest your own seeds you really never need to get seeds again so long as it's done right and each year even if you're not going to eat a certain food or plant a certain thing if it's something you like plant a couple just to harvest the seeds from you can get a huge store of seeds and while they'd like to tell you you need to buy a new batch every year I would say that it, um, here's the things the genetics are preserved in the seed it's either going to grow or it's not they have found red lotus seeds up to 1,300 years old in tombs that sprouted. So some seeds will last thousands of years. Some people believe that some spores can last millions of years or longer in the vacuum of space, too. So the point, I guess, being that once, if the genetic information's there and, it, and it's viable, then you can grow it, and that's phenomenal. I mean, you might be able to bring back very old mushrooms and plants, but... Um, as far as having your own, you know, there is a seed, a seed vault. It's, it's uh, I think it's up in Norway or something, but they, it's maybe what, Greenland? Anyhow, it's the largest uh, seed vault, and it's a really huge facility with millions and millions of seeds all labeled and put away, and the idea is to preserve the genetics in case anything happens. A disaster tomorrow, or a blight, or some kind of a disease, parasite, could wipe out huge crops. And the way that we farm right now with monoculture is just ludicrous. I mean, everybody knows, everybody's upset about the Monsanto and, and saying it's not just the GMO. It's not the fact that these things are modified. It's the fact that they're modified to resist Roundup. And Roundup itself is a chemical which can be dangerous, obviously, to consume. But it also... Um, leaves the plants open when you're doing monoculture to certain diseases. You know, most people don't realize that the bananas that your parents ate, if you're the same my age, and the bananas that we eat, 
when we were kids, and kids today, they're different bananas. That I think it was the, the Cavendish banana, I can't remember which one was the old one, but there was like a disease that wiped out all of them, all of the uh, banana trees, and, and basically they went extinct. So they had to go to another type of banana. So all the bananas we eat today aren't as good and delicious as the ones before. And there have been quite a few strains like that. The problem is that once we're utilizing one particular strain for something, it makes it that much easier to devastate, you know, the food bank. Like, with the potato blight, you know. What happened in the, the Irish potato famine? I mean, that was a huge deal, you know. <laughs> um, but it's easy for history to just kind of be blown off, you know, and we think that we're better today, you know. But uh, I think that we've got quite a bit to learn about taking care of ourselves. And this is why I grow my own food when I can. It's not for a matter of being able to feed myself. It's for a matter of if the shit hits the fan. I want to know how to put some seeds in the ground and grow food. I don't want to have to grab a manual because I'll tell you, no matter of reading books is going to teach you how to grow food. I mean, if you don't start now and learn when's the proper time to harvest, what kind of soil conditions do they like, you know, how to keep bugs and diseases off um, as a, you know, someone who was really into cannabis when I was younger and uh, I got into horticulture and I got into plants and naturally just led into a variety of plants. I love all different types of, of not just food-based plants or medicine-based plants, but just the beauty of flowers and trees in general and the interconnectedness. And it's only in the last five, six years that I actually learned more about how uh, the mycelium play a role and how they the connection between the trees, and that trees actually feed their young, you know? Where we're taught that there's this forest where all these trees and bushes are competing for sunlight, and they're competing for nutrients. And then we find out that they're actually forcing nutrients purposefully down through their trunk, out up into the smaller trees to feed them. Trees, nature is not dumb, it's innately intelligent, and knows what it needs. So, if it was selfish in hoarding all these nutrients, they'd be locked up for a long time. When a tree knows it's, it's, it's getting old, it can push the nutrients out, but even when it's in its middle age, it can still feed its young. And it seems to know and have an affinity for its young, and know that. And is that a big surprise? The trees feed their young? No. But you tell, you know, any, any uh, botanist that 20 years ago, or a scientifically minded person, then they'd just be like, just like saying plants aren't intelligent. Maybe not in the way that we are. But they found that on their growth tips, you know, they say that that kind of they kind of represent an intelligence. It's like their minds may be in their roots, but you know, then it gets into the realm of speculation. What really matters is knowing. If people can talk about what plants know and don't know all day long, but a person who grows their own food knows that your plants do respond to your attention. They respond to you putting in the time and effort, not just to feed them properly and take care of them, but to actually want them to grow, and, you know, that's l taking a leap. I know a lot of people would say there's no scientific evidence to show that you talking to your plants is going to help them grow, yet I do talk to my plants, and I talk to all plants, and uh, whether it works or not doesn't seem to matter. What really matters is that um, if you love growing plants and you take care of your plants, they will be lush and green for you, and the minute you start to neglect them, you know, and just treat them as a cash crop, um, they seem to lose their magic. There's just something about it. And this is why I have a problem with massively produced crops. And this is what's happening to cannabis. Like things like Colorado, you know, and here in Washington there's huge, huge pot crops that are grown. And it's basically, you know, one strain, two strains, three strains, whatever, but it's done on a massive scale to where no individual plants is really cared for. Does that really matter or should it matter? Maybe not, but it does to the person who consumes it. Just like a person wants to know that the farmer cared about the food that they're eating, you know, and, and uh, things that are hand-picked as opposed to machine-picked. It's kind of a, a tough one. I mean, nutrients are nutrients, right? Cannabis is cannabis, right? But it's not. We, Even though we may know that it may be chemically the same, there's just something about it that we like to know that our food's grown properly and harvested properly. So, anyway, enough rambling about food. Just wanted to tell everyone, really, to, uh, if you haven't done so yet, order yourself some heirloom organic seeds and make sure that they're they're not, you know, modified. But you got to realize that almost all the human 
the foods, the, the cash crops, the crops that we grow right now, they've all been genetically modified by us, not through genetic manipulation, but by selective breeding. You pick the biggest banana, you, you pick the biggest orange, you, you take the, the very largest strawberry plants and you breed these things because that's over thousands of years. I mean, corn used to be tiny. And it wasn't that we modified the genetics, it's just that we selectively, we selected for those genetics. And over time, we've basically been able to create, uh, I guess, kind of select the genetics that we want in food and be able to get the biggest and the best. And that's really helping us, but at the same time, it's causing a lot of problems because we don't know <laughs> which things are modified and which things are just big. But what I wanted to say was that everybody should buy some more organic heirloom seeds of a variety of types, plant them, and learn how to grow them. Uh, the future may be guerrilla gardening right here in our towns. Okay. They're already doing it in New York, but uh, in a lot of cities they're doing that, rooftop gardens, and right now it's just kind of a trend. But it may be essential in the future. It may be imperative that we have these things. In my opinion, in the next 10-15 years, any city that doesn't have rooftop gardens is going to be wasting space, in a way. There are so many benefits to uh, to using empty spaces and lots and vacant lots for guerrilla gardening. And some places people have been forced out and they're not allowed to do this and they've had to fight for their rights. There's some towns that have banned gardens in your front yard because of the aesthetics and then people say it's a conspiracy and not let them grow their food. And there have been people who were stopped from growing food. There was one place, a few places, where people had their gardens torn up by the city in their own yards. And, of course, guerrilla gardens in vacant lots the same way. Like, it's inappropriate to grow food. And it's not that it's trying, it's not that there's a giant conspiracy by everyone to keep people unhealthy. It's just that people are scared of raw food now. We are so used to processed crap and bologna and growing up on Velveeta that all of a sudden when people start thinking of going back to raw milk, you know, unpasteurized foods, it makes them nervous. They hear about one case where somebody got sick and all of a sudden, no, no, we got to step in and, and stop it. It's not trying to make people sick. It's on the contrary. People are just dumb enough to think that by banning raw foods, it's keeping people safe. Uh, and then there are some people, of course, who have a vested interest in the you know, corporate entities and and their food, but places like Monsanto, they don't have to give a shit about a backyard gardener. They make billions and billions. They, you know, they make their money. You know, it's, it's, if anybody else wants to force out the small guy, then that's great for them, but long story short, they're making a lot of money, and uh, not seeming to care about the public's opinion. So it's up to us to grow our own food. And it's not just Monsanto. I'm not a huge... I'm not sitting here ripping completely on Monsanto. I know that the intention of a lot of the scientists that work for them are good. That they're thinking, if I invent this and I can fix these genes to make this resistant to this, then I can feed more people. That's the thought of the scientists doing the work. It's just the people with the cash, the people on top that decide, well, we're just going to ignore these results or the dangers of GMOs and just go with what we want. And so goes big business. So it's up to us as individuals to grow our own food. So. Do it if you can. And even if you don't have very much space, come together with your neighbors. Maybe take a little side lot, you know, in the front or between your houses or something and just, you know, start. It just amazes me how many people have never grown their own food and harvested it and eaten it. Even a basic, something as small as a carrot, you know. It's very rewarding. Um, more people need to do it. And, uh, yeah. Those are my thoughts on food. I need to grow more. Here I am talking about my empty garden. You can see it over here. Doo, 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 doo. My lowly tobacco plants there. Anyhow, take care everybody and uh, talk to you all later.